Hello everyone. Tonight I'm going to be recording some uh, video of what is pretty much my favorite video game of the last year. Uh, it's a relatively new roguelike called Sill. I'm assuming if you're watching this you know what a roguelike is. Uh, the first one I ever played was NetHack, and then after a few years of that I accidentally played a roguelike on DS called uh, Shirin's, Shirin the Wanderer or something like this. And then I played a whole bunch of them before settling on Angband for about a year, and Angband is one of the, the older roguelikes, which descends from Moria, I believe, which I never played, but is supposedly pretty hardcore. But uh, the thing that those games share is that they tend to be pretty long. So uh, a NetHack game or an Angband game tends to be quite a time investment, If that's assuming you even survive. Uh, Sill is a really stripped-down roguelike, which has like a huge variety of gameplay, but the game ends pretty quickly, so whether you win or lose, it's only going to take about three or four hours. Uh, maybe a tiny bit longer, depending on how long uh, the last stage of the game takes, but instead of talking about all that, let's just get right into it. Um, I've played quite a few games of Sill now, and one of the advantages of the Angband Descendant roguelikes is that if you kill, some, kill a character, which happens like all the time, um, if you reuse the save file to create a new game... Oh, this one's still alive. Let's kill her. Yeah, I want to kill you. Um, if you reuse a save file of a dead character over and over again, anything they've seen in the dungeon, so any monsters that they've seen before, things like that, it gets retained in the game's memory. So if you see a monster that you saw 10 games ago and you want to remember what it did, you can take a look at it and you'll still have that in your in your memory. So in Syl, there are four races that you can pick from. There are no classes. Uh, Syl's really weird because there are no levels. Um, I'll explain that a bit later. But there's no experience levels per se. There's just uh, experience by itself doesn't do anything until you spend it on skills. And then each set of skills also has some abilities associated with it you can pick. But uh, Sill also is based on uh, the old like first age of the Lord of the Rings or all of Tolkien's work. I, I've read the Lord of the Rings. I've read the Silmarillion, but I'm not hardcore about it like the Sill authors are. So I don't know the, the details of it, but all I know is it's very fanatically um, stuck to the first age of Tolkien's work. And that means that a lot of things have funny names, but it also means that uh, stuff that you're used to seeing in the Angband stuff like Gollum and things like that aren't in the game at all. Um, and usually most Angband style roguelikes, the goal is to go down to the very bottom of the dungeon, kill Morgoth, who's like the evil death god, and then that's it, you're done. Uh, in Sill, they kind of accept the fact that Morgoth is a god, and you probably shouldn't be killing him, although you can. But the goal of the game is to kind of reenact one of the stories from the Silmarillion, which I think is called the, the Lay of Lorien or something. And it involves you going down to the bottom of the dungeon, which is only 20 floors in Sill, and you got to rip a Silmaril, which is like a jewel, out of Morgoth's crown and then get the hell out. Um, you can take more than one, you can try to kill Morgoth and take all three, um, but the base goal of the game is to take one and get out. And uh, when you go to create a character, which we're doing now, there are actually four types of characters, and each of them have their own kind of families you can pick from. But this isn't like other games, well, not all other games, but this is kind of different in the sense that what your race selection kind of governs how hard the game is. Not totally, but in general. So the Noldor are like the, the super awesome elves, and you can see they get quite a, quite a group of stat boosts. Um, the Sindar are like normal elves. I don't really remember how that works in the Lord of the Rings, but they're like lesser elves, I guess. They're the ones that Frodo and them talk to. Um, the Nogrim are actually just dwarves. And then the Edain are humans. Uh, the Edain kind of suck. So if you want to really huge challenge the Edain are the way to go, I still really suck at this game, despite having played it for a long time. Uh, so I always go with the Nolder. So you'll see here the stats in Sil aren't very like complicated. They all start at zero as a base, and then you get bonuses on that. So the base, like, normal stat for a normal human in Sill is zero. It's not, like, 13 or 14 or anything like that. And the stats don't go super high. So, well, you can get them super high, but in general, they don't go super high on their own. Um, so let's pick Noldor. I like this. We're just going to play, like, a pretty standard game at first. We're not going to do anything crazy. I'll probably die pretty quick because I, I usually rely pretty heavily on uh, a skill called smithing that lets you create your own weapons and armor, and that really increases your survivability in the early game, in my opinion. But we won't do that this time. And uh, as such, it doesn't really matter what we pick here. So let's go with 
So you'll see here each character gets a set of like proficiencies and affinities. Blade proficiency means you get like plus one with any uh, sword that you use, plus one to hit. All elves get that. Same thing with bows, they have an archery affinity. Uh, oh no, that's not true, sorry. Affinity is different. Um, affinity means that, I'll show you later, you can learn abilities with particular skills. And affinity means that you will be able to learn the first skill, the first ability of that skill that you pick for free. So th this isn't super important right now. But what is important kind of is the stat distribution. So if I was more concerned about uh, smithing, I would go with the Fionor elves because they get a smithing affinity, which helps a lot. Dexterity in this game is super important. Constitution is kind of important. And then depending on your build, grace is important or not. Uh, strength, mm, it does well for damage, but that's about all it does. So it's not, it's probably the least important in my opinion of, of all the stats. So I never play Finurfin, so that's, it's a hilarious name. Let's go with Finurfin. Uh, and to be honest, I don't usually pay too, too much attention to the stats that I'm picking, depending on the build. Like, you usually figure it out after killing a character a billion times whether your stats are well allocated or not, but... Um, in Silly, you get, in addition to the, the base, like, starting stats of a particular character, you get to allocate your own. So, uh, like I said, Dexterity is super important. Let's spend some on that. I don't like floating around at 28 HP, so let's put some in there. Um, that leaves us with not much room for Grace. There, that's pretty good. I usually end up with this distribution a lot. Um, you can do cute things like this, but let's let's stay 4 for 4 um, so at the beginning of the game, you also get to allocate what your starting skills are, but I'm not going to do that yet. Let's just get the game started. So here you can see I have 5,000 experience to start, and I have eight different skills that I can pick from. The first four skills are uh, boosted by dexterity, so you see that because I have four dexterity, I get plus four to melee, archery, evasion, and stealth. Um, and because I have four grace, I get plus four to perception, will, smithing, and song. All these things get skill checked. Melee is really important for hitting things. Archery is really important for hitting things with arrows. Evasion is important for dodging things. Stealth is important for not being heard. Um, perception is important for seeing stuff in the dungeon, uh, including traps and, and monsters and things like that. Will is important for a whole bunch of stuff, uh, using staves, um, resisting stat drains, resisting um, like par paralysis, all kinds of things. Super useful. Uh, Smithing is used to create stuff, which we're not going to do this game, so we'll keep that at zero. And then Song is awesome. Song is the equivalent of this game's magic. There are no spells, you don't shoot fireballs and things like that, but you have songs that can kind of give you like an aura effect for a while, and they burn voice, which is your magic points in this game. But that's the only kind of magic. There are no, um, like I said, magic missiles or heal spells. You can't heal and still unless you have an item to do it. Uh, there's a song that lets you do it, but it costs a lot of money, uh, a lot of experience. So I'm just not going to pick anything for now. Uh, this stuff doesn't matter. Your gender doesn't matter. Your description is just for fun. Uh, age. Wow, that's the youngest elf I've ever seen. There we go. Uh, doesn't matter. And then your name certainly doesn't matter. Just call this Devo. Cool. Alright, so we get started. So when you start the game in Sil, you have no weapons. You have a torch. Uh, you start with a certain number of torches, which... If you start with few, it makes the game a tiny bit harder. We got a whole bunch this time, which is great. Uh, you can see all these different windows, but I'll, I'll explain them later, but it's pretty self-explanatory. This is what I have in my inventory. This is what I'm wearing. This, when there are monsters, it'll show you where they are and who they are. This is just the game talking to me. And the combat rolls is more useful as you get better at the game, because you understand more what it takes to hit a monster. Um, and I'll explain that in our first combat. But right now we have no skills, which means that we're terrible. And in Sil, the game always starts with a curved sword being found on the ground uh, in the first room. That's all you get, so I'm going to wield that. Uh, the weight of a weapon means a lot in Sil. Um, I'll explain some of those equations later when it becomes more important. But for now, it's just important to know that the weight and damage and two hit of a curved sword, when you take them all in combination, it's pretty crappy. So it's not a great weapon. You want to get rid of it pretty soon. It can be pretty good depending on what you do, but... Nobody is ever going to have a curved sword past, like, the fourth floor unless something drastic has happened. Um, so, like I said, we're going to play a pretty simple character this time. So I'm just going to buff melee, which is super important, and evasion, which is also important. Um, let's not do stealth, because I want to show you what it takes to survive in the game without sneaking around. And let's stop there for a sec. So all I did there was just spend experience on certain skills. These don't do anything, they're not like 
abilities, they're just my base capabilities. Um, so now you'll see I have plus nine to melee, whereas before I had plus four. Um, and I have plus 10 to evasion, whereas before I had uh, plus five, I guess. So the way you read these numbers, if you see curl, uh, curly braces, like normal parentheses, that means it's an attack-related quantity. If you see a plus something, that means you're two hit. And then if you see a x, d, y, that's your damage when you hit. Um, and then for defense-related stuff, if it's you'll see those in square brackets. The plus whatever is evasion. Uh, so it's how hard you are to hit for your evasion roll. And then the 0 to 0 or 0 to 5, that's just another way of showing your protection dice. Actually, that's curious. I wonder why they don't show... I guess because they have to add so many of them. So yeah, your protection is usually a number from like... It'll say like 3 to 5, and that's how much damage you will reduce if you get hit. But again, I'll explain combat when we get to the actual combat. I want to start moving. But the last thing to show you is that in Sil, you have all these... Um, oops. Yeah, you have all these skill categories that I showed before on the character sheet. If you hit tab during the game, you can actually pick a skill category, so I'm going to pick melee, and there's a whole bunch of abilities, like, I don't know, if you play Diablo 2, I don't play new games, so, but if you play Diablo 2, they have skill trees where certain skills rely on other ones, um, there are a whole bunch of different builds you can do in still, as you can see, because there are so many different abilities that you can spend experience on, so, in order to get an ability, you have to spend money on the skill type, so here we spent, sorry, when I said money, I meant experience, there's no gold in this game, um, I, spilled, I spent experience on melee, so that means I get to go through here, and now I've opened up, I've unlocked some abilities. And the reason why I spent five on melee is because charge is a melee ability that's insanely useful. Um, basically what charge does is, if you take a step before you hit a monster, and then you hit it, it doubles your damage dice when you hit it, more or less. I might be wrong there, but that's, that's kind of what it does. And in the early game, that's incredibly helpful. Uh, and then from evasion, usually one of the first abilities you want to get if you're not creating equipment is sprinting and that has a prerequisite of dodging so what sprinting lets you do is after you take a few steps it increases your speed so you can take more turns per step or per uh, per action so if you take one turn it only consumes like half of a monster's turn so you can double the no amount of turns um, that was a horrible explanation but it doesn't matter right now because we don't have it so I'm going to put some more points into evasion because we're going to need seven eventually and that's good for now so this is a really bare bones build. I'm going to look around the map just to see what kind of shape the level has, and let's get moving. So off we go. The first floor is pretty tame. Um, because you have no armor, it's you can get surrounded and get killed pretty easily. Um, rope is totally useless. But other than that, once you've played a few times, the first floor is kind of a joke. Uh, so you see, I've been trying to smash this door because I can't pick it because my perception is terrible. You need perception to pick locks. Uh, and if you whack into a door too many times, or if you fail a, a certain skill roll, you get stunned, which takes minus two away from all your skill rolls, uh, which is not a big deal right now, but it becomes a huge deal later. Nothing here. That little pointy arrow down is a downstairs. We're not going to go there yet. So as I'm walking, uh, Sil has kind of a turn timer. You can only stay on a certain depth of the dungeon for so long. So you'll see here uh, on the left column it says, you know, there's game turn, experience pool, blah, blah, blah. Depth and min depth. Depth is the depth I'm at right now, so I'm on the first floor, 50 feet. Min depth is how shallow I'm allowed to stay. So if my min depth goes to 100 feet as time goes on, and I'm still on 50 and I try to walk upstairs, it'll kick me down. So there's basically, a, if you ever play Bubble Bobble, it's like the little whale that comes to eat you if you take too long. So this is a, a mold here. This is a very inanimate <laughs> first monster to fight. They hit really hard because they ignore defense, which we don't have right now. Um, but they don't move, so they're pretty easy to fight. I have charge, so they're easy to kill. So you're going to see, I'm going to take one step forward, and then because I'm still moving roughly in that direction, if I attack it, I get a big damage bonus. Um, and now I'm going to step back so I can do it again. And one last time, and it's dead. And we get some experience. As you kill the same monster over and over again in Sil, the experience you get for it becomes less. Also, you get experience in Sil for just seeing the monster. And I'll show you that when we first run into what will probably be a wolf pretty soon. There aren't too many monster types on the first floor. There's these worm masses. I don't often find them here. Take a look. But you can see, if you can read all this crap if you want. See, I've seen this monster before in a previous game, so I know a lot about it. But if you go to the very bottom, it says, encountering another would be worth 10 experience. So just for looking at one, I get 10 experience next time. And if I kill this one, I'll get 20. So I'm going to go kill it. Uh, worms are a pain because if you stand around them for too long, they start to reproduce explosively. 
they're slow and they don't hit hard, but they can fill up an entire dungeon really quickly. And some of the later worms are just awful, some of the things they do. Uh, they can poison you or create a lot of darkness or just dig up the dungeon. Uh, alarm trap just alerts monsters. I don't really care that much. Let's try and disarm it. With zero perception points invested, I will probably set off every trap that I try to disarm. So I just basically trigger them. Um, and so far, not so much happening. Ooh, leather boots. That's useful. So armor weight has a big effect on this game, too. Um, depending on the kind of build you're going for. Oh, okay. So here we're fighting a wolf. This thing's probably going to die. Wolves are a pain because they're fast. So if you try to run away from them, they can still catch up to you and bite you. But, I mean, normal wolves are pathetically weak. And they have no protection, basically. So it's really easy to splatter them all over the walls. Uh, but if you're playing a challenge character like any Dane, a human, uh, wolves are actually really dangerous. Even one of them can kill you quickly with a critical, so we have it easy, or an elf. Alright, so now I'm about to get into a fight while I'm stunned. This is not the greatest idea, but it could be a lot worse. There's a corridor behind me I can run into. And this is another thing you don't often want to do, is uh, fight monsters while there are worms in the room, because you can see that they're already replicating like crazy. And for this kind of worm, it's not a big deal. Actually, at this level, it's kind of advantageous because I can farm them for experience, which is pretty boring, but... Um, these are skeletons. I think it's the only useless item in all of Cell, as far as I can tell. They don't do anything except add flavor. That's a very spooky tilde on that screen. Ah, so an Orc Scout. So this is where you start getting into some interesting mechanics in Cell. Orc Scouts suck at everything except screaming, which doesn't seem like a big deal. But because the monsters in Sil are fairly intelligent, uh, if there's a pack of orcs, like a few rooms over, and that thing screams, they're going to come and look what's going on. Same thing with this alarm trap over my head. It does the same thing, pretty much. Um, depending on how many doors are closed between you and the bad guys, the sound will carry farther. Uh, so I killed most of the enemies on this floor any already. I'm not too scared of these scouts. But shouting monsters get real bad uh, in deeper floors where the bad guys are, are harder to kill. Um, also, at any given time, see, you can just see this now. This normal orc soldier, which is actually a pretty hard guy to beat at this depth, uh, they really start showing up on the next floor uh, in, in big groups. These guys came up the stairs, so it, there's a certain chance with every turn that a bunch of monsters will come up or down the stairs, and just they're kind of like wandering monsters, but they come in packs. So it's a horrible idea to fight near stairs, because you can be in the middle of a, a, a brawl with a really hard monster, and then like 20 orcs can come up the stairs, literally. So... You can, I don't know how easy it is for you to see on video, but there's a little shady square underlying this orc, and it says he's unwary. He doesn't know I'm here right now, so he's awake and he's moving. If I have high stealth, <coughs> I can actually walk right past him and he won't notice me. I do not have the high stealth right now, so he's going to see me pretty quick. There he is, and now he shouted, so now everybody knows I'm here. Now I'm going to charge the first one, and I'll probably get a second hit off and kill him. Nope. So again, at this level, with no armor, it's not the greatest idea to fight two monsters at once. But I have pretty good hit points. I'm going to dodge back. And you'll see, this orc knows that he's the only one left, so he's chasing me. But if they're in a group, they'll actually hover around the exit to the corridor and wait you out. Sweet, I got some arrows. Oh, I didn't even know he was there. And I Wow, how many orcs are in this corridor? Ooh, great. Okay. So a battle axe is... Not the greatest weapon for an elf, because they don't get that uh, blade proficiency. This is a 3d6 battle axe. Okay, so most battle axes are 3d5. The extra damage side, the 3d6, is, is awesome. Uh, that's a higher quality axe. So you'll randomly get some good bonuses to weapons. Um, just whatever. Sorry, that wasn't really a great sentence, but I'm also drinking beer while I'm playing this, and the beer distracted me. So I'm pretty much done with this floor, but what I was going to say is right now I have no shield. And the battle axe is actually a really strong weapon when you use it with both hands. You can use it either with the shield or without. But unless you're a dwarf, using a one-handed battle axe is not such a great idea for an uh, Well, like, unless you're a dwarf, basically. Because they get an axe proficiency. Okay, so you'll see I got some experience for going down the floor. If I want, I could go back up and do that floor again. Not the exact same one, but at the same depth. But we're pretty strong right now. There's no need to repeat floors. And again, you have this timer. Ideally, you spend as much time as possible on the 950 foot, or the, the 19th floor, because that's where the best stuff is, and the more time you spend down there, the stronger you'll be for the throne room, but that's an ideal. Uh, I've had characters who got down there in like, I don't know, like 
3,000 turns and we're only on 500 now, so you can really just dive. But unless you have high stealth, um, you're going to die. And even if you have high stealth, you're probably going to die. So it goes in roguelikes. Um, so in the next fight, I'll explain a bit more about the battle mechanics, just in case you're curious. It's okay, so still we're fighting wolves. Now you're going to see my damage take a huge uptick, because I'm... Before I only had two D7, I think, with the curved sword. So when I charge somebody, I got four D7. Now I have three D8, and if I charge somebody, I'm gonna get six D8. So come here, little wolf. Okay. So that wasn't great. Now I'm gonna bring into uh, bring your attention to the combat rolls down here. So I told you before, if you're curious about combat, still actually tells you everything that's going on. And the formulas you use to compute how much damage you're gonna do are super simple. Uh, this is going to take about a minute, so if this is not anything you want to know, you can pretty much just fast forward. But that hit I did was a normal hit. There were no criticals involved, so this is pretty easy to figure out. So you can see here that uh, the blue are my rolls when I hit that wolf. So plus six is my melee score. So I got plus six to hit. And then on top of that, I roll a d20. So I rolled a nine. That's not the greatest roll. So my total melee score was 15. This little dude rolled a 4 on his d20, and he gets plus 2 to uh, evade. So he's trying to dodge, basically. So he gets plus 2 to evasion. I think because he was unwary, his, his evasion was low. Or at least he was scared or something, I don't know. But anyways, his bonus evasion was plus 2. And then he rolled a 4. So 4, 15, I don't really understand how the difference between that was 5. So maybe I'm... Oh, no, no, no. I'm a tool. My, it, it rolled d20 and got 3, I guess. Anyways, the big point here is that the difference between my melee roll and his evasion roll was five. If it's this number, as long as it's positive, I hit. Okay, that's really the important part. The bigger the number, the more criticals you'll get. And that, the number that you need for criticals is like seven plus your weapon weight. Um, so if your weapon weight is three pounds, that means for every 10 you get here, you get a critical. So 10 would be a critical, 20 would be two criticals, 30 would be three criticals. So you can see why your weapon weight really has a big deal to do with criticals. So really what you want is your weapon weight to be as light as possible in order to get the strength bonus to damage. But that's not important, I'll talk about that later. The second part here is that once I hit, I told you because I charged, I got 68. So 3d8 times two. So it looks like I knew what how charge worked anyways. So I rolled 6d8s. And I got 22, which, as far as I can tell, is not great. He rolled a 4 on his protection dice of 1d4, which is awesome. Good job, little wolf. But the difference between that is 18, so I think he still died, because his HP sucks. Um, and that's it. That's how combat works. You roll your combat roll, he rolls his evasion roll. The difference tells you how many criticals you get. And then once you've hit, you roll your damage dice. And then the difference is your damage between his protection roll. Um, all a critical does is add one more damage dice. So in this case, if I'd gotten one critical, you would have seen one exclamation mark up here, and I would have gotten 78. Um, if you have a really light weapon, like I've had a, a short sword eye smith that had 0.9 pound weapon weight once, and I did all kinds of things to reduce the, the number I need to get criticals, there's abilities for that, uh, you can get like 13 criticals in one hit, and if your damage is like 1d9, you'll get 13 or 14d9, and that's a pretty big hit, so those are fun to watch. Um, so enough with the nerd math. Let's commence playing again. Uh, whack these wolves to death. And he's gone. Cool. So let's keep exploring. There's a trap. A gas trap. Um, you can do all kinds of things. My least favorite one is the one that makes you lose memories, which erases the map of the floor you're on, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you're being chased by orcs and you've already found the stairs, you really want to remember where those stairs are. Uh, also, if you found a forge and you want to go back, I'll show forges later. There's one on this floor for sure. You'll notice there that I closed the door as I ran away. Um, animals in Sill, unless they're marginally intelligent or just like really belligerent, they won't try to open doors. Uh, certain kinds of intelligent monsters like wargs, orc wolves, can smash down doors. But it's a pretty good habit, depending on your playstyle, to close doors behind you. Oh, cool, the orcs found a secret door for me. They're on patrol. Oh, he found me. Okay, see, I should not be surrounded by our soldiers at this stage in the game, because I have no armor, and they will kill me. So you can see now, because they're in a group, they're fighting with kind of like group tactics, which you can kind of take advantage of when you're in a corridor like this, because they'll just keep bouncing back and forth, and they don't seem to realize that you have charge. This is something I'd like to see changed in later 
versions of this game. Um, if I have charge, they really shouldn't be hovering around the entrance like that. But it helped me there. I got to kill them. But they're really smart. They will actually, if you're lined up in a corridor with three of them in a row, they will keep trading as they get lower on HP. So if the first guy in the front gets really hurt, he'll slide towards the back and let the less hurt guy move forward. All right, so now we encounter some more interesting monsters here. This little brown mold, he's just like the gray mold that we killed before, except when he hits you, there's a chance that he might confuse you, uh, which means you can't really control what your character is going to do, which is really annoying. Um, but with charge, again, most molds aren't that great. I could take some will. Will helps you resist the confusion effect, but I'm just going to kill all these monsters first. So the centipede is a fast monster who's kind of erratic. Um, he doesn't always move in the most optimal way. Like He can be attacking you and then just get bored and walk in a different direction. But if you look at his defense rating, it's quite high, 44. So <coughs> he's not hard to hit, but he's hard to damage. And for me, that's not going to be a problem because when I charge with an axe, I get a lot of damage like that. But for a, a stealthy character with a sword who um, is kind of light and doesn't do super heavy damage unless they critical, it's really hard to kill those monsters. So there are different kinds of monster types in Cell, I guess, and there are certain kinds that just have really high protection, and for certain kinds of character builds, they're really hard to kill. Um, so centipedes can actually be a really nasty thing to fight in the early game uh, for certain builds. You can see this room is really dark, and I think this might be a forge. Yeah, so the forges usually have harder monsters around them. This is a white wolf. These guys are brutal, but I'm wearing no armor right now, so I'm really stealthy. Uh, but it's a bad idea to fight in here, so I'm going to get out, because you never know what's in a forge. Usually, it's something you don't want to fight, and if they surround you in the dark, you're dead. Um, a lot of times, there are worms in the second floor forge. So, we're at the second floor. You're guaranteed to find a forge on the second floor. What you're not guaranteed is how many uses you'll get. <clears throat> you can get two to four uses of a forge, depending. So, finding a four-use forge on the second story is amazing. Um, I have no smithing skills, and I'm not going to spend any experience on smithing, so we won't do this this time, but uh, here's the smithing interface. You can create some stuff. I can't really do anything, so I'm just not going to. But this is usually kind of like your first checkpoint in the game, if you have smithing, is you come here and you make some awesome equipment, and you're ready to go. I am going to spend some experience. So... I'm really gunning for smithing. I have enough skill points to get it, but it has dodging as a prereq, which is unfortunate because dodging sucks. Um, so what I could do is buy dodging now, and then when I get enough experience for sprinting, which I'll need a thousand, I could buy that when I have that much experience. But dodging by itself does very little, so I'm just going to pool all my experience until I have 1,500 so I can buy dodging and sprinting at the same time. That way, if I get in trouble later and I need to spend the experience on something else, uh, I can do that. So as an example, if you accidentally put on a cursed piece of equipment because you haven't identified it, there's a skill called curse breaking that I can spend four skill points in will and just get this and break the curse. So let's say I had you know, 1,400 experience somewhere down in the dungeon and I put on a pair of boots that slowed me down. I'm going to die if I have slow boots. It's like, I don't even know why they let you live at that point. Being slow is impossible to overcome. Um, so I could spend my experience on Will instead and get that ability and break the curse. So I'm just going to pull my experience right now. Ooh, special arrows. So there aren't that many arrow types. You can usually guess what they are. The only two special arrows are piercing, which is awesome. It ignores a lot of the monster's armor. Or poisoned, and poison is far more likely, so... Those are almost certainly poison arrows. Um, but I don't have a bow, so this is completely irrelevant at this point. Ooh, a cloak. That's useful. And this is not the greatest armor. Studded leather has a pretty big evasion penalty, minus two. And the uh, protection roll 1d6 is not high. But it's all I got, so I'm going to wear it. Uh, you'll see it's pretty heavy, too, 13 pounds. So for every, fifth, no, for every 10 pounds of armor weight you have, you get a stealth penalty, which is minus one. So if I have 30 pounds of armor, I get minus 3 to stealth. Stealth is really important in this game. Um, the best way to survive in Scylla is not to fight. You can actually create pacifist builds that just ignore everything. And I have no protection right now. Like, 2 to 7 is not high. So for me to be making a lot of noise is not a great idea. That's why studded leather is not such great armor, because the trade-offs are shitty. And I have a short bow. And I'm going to fire one of these arrows... 
definitely target this guy. Oh yeah, sorry. Let's hit him. Okay, so the reason why I fired those arrows is that... Uh, sometimes you'll notice that you've poisoned an enemy, and then for every item that you identify, you get 100 experience. So I like to identify as many items as I can in the early game, because that 100 experience is a big deal right now. Nothing here. Nothing here. So the other thing while I'm walking, I'm going to go find a down staircase, because I think that's the whole level. Down staircase, top left. While I'm walking, you'll notice that, you know, I've been spending experience stuff, but like I said before, there are no experience levels in this game at all. Um, and there are no stat boosts either, other than equipment, and uh, each of the skill trees at the very top end of the tree has a stat boost in it. So 20 skill points, if I put that into melee, which is like a huge amount of experience, um, I can buy a point of strength. Archery, I can buy a point of dexterity, blah, blah, blah. But unless I do one of those things, I can't get stat boosts. And one of the weird things about Syl that you might be surprised by is that because my HP is completely governed by my constitution score, my con is 4, unless I spend points on constitution, my health will stay the same the whole game. Um, so your HP does not go up throughout the course of the game, neither does your MP, unless you specifically invest in skills or stats that will uh, improve it. So I've had characters on the very bottom floor of the dungeon that had like 20 HP, um, which is a bit scary, but... It's just the way the game works, and I think it's quite interesting. Okay, so I'm going to go explore the right side of this level first because it seems to sprawl over to the left. Uh, these spiders are nasty. Um, spiders move quickly as long as they can see you. As soon as you fall out of their line of sight, they forget, they're kind of like ADHD, they forget that you're there. This one can't see me right now, and he probably won't see me until I'm down his throat. So I'm just going to go axe his face off, and he's dead. Those are really nasty for stealthy kind of characters who have a light weapon. Um, because they hit with uh, a really high attack score, a really high melee score, which means they get crazy criticals on you. Um, but I killed that one pretty quick. Uh, they're really bad to have chasing you because they'll just keep biting you, even though you're running away. Whereas most normal speed monsters can't hit you unless you do something wrong. So I could wear this for the extra... 1d1 protection but I don't like the minus one melee penalty so I'm just gonna hold on to them in case I need them uh, that you'll see there sorry I should explain that uh, the set of gauntlets they have a normal parentheses score of minus one normal parentheses you remember are always attack so minus one to that means minus one to my attack and then plus zero means I get no evasion out of it in the square brackets but I got 1d1 protection so you'll see if I wear them my melee is plus six and now it'll go down to plus four which I don't want, so I'm going... Sorry, plus five, I meant. Let's go take off the gauntlets. Okay. Up we go. To be honest, this is... Given the equipment I found right now, and given how much attention I'm playing, I'm paying attention to this game, like, while I'm talking, I'm probably going to die on this floor. Uh, yeah, usually if my attention is wandering with a character that doesn't have custom-made equipment, if I get to 200 feet, I'll probably die. So with this character, I'm probably going to try to go for a protection build instead of stealth, which means that I want a lot of armor weight. And I'll show you why later. There's some skills that if you put a lot of armor on, like heavy armor, you get better protection even than what you uh, have as the base dice. So I found a pair of leather boots on the floor that's 2.2 pounds. I'm wearing a pair that's 2.6. I'm just going to keep the heavy ones on. Whereas normally, if I'm worried about my stealth, I would be trying to find the lightest armor possible. Um, no, my battle axe is better than this. Yeah, so you see the big variation in damage die. So this one is 3d6, which is really good. 3d4 is pretty normal. 3d5 is actually quite common as well. I don't, I haven't seen many 3d6 axes like ever. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but it, in the early game, these little things can make a big difference. So there aren't really any dangerous monsters in this room. So I'm gonna attack this confusion causing monster, and he's dead. Uh, and we're getting really close to the 1500 experience I need. Okay, so the Hummerhorn, this is a fly. It's really freaking annoying. They move really fast. They have a high evasion, no protection at all. Um, basically what this means is you have to swat them. Like, you need a fly swatter, and I've got a huge melee penalty right now, plus six. 
Um, ideally, if I had a dagger or a short sword right now, that would be better. Because hitting him with my current melee score is going to suck. However, with arrows, um, when you shoot somebody with an arrow, because it's hard to dodge a projectile, they get half of their evasion score. So basically, it's way easier to hit things with arrows than it is with weapons. Even if your archery score isn't great. So I only have plus 5 to archery. But shooting this thing is actually a way better idea than hitting it because he gets half of his evasion score. Now, well, it doesn't matter. I hit him with the axe anyways. Uh, if you take a shot, like an arrow shot, at an enemy when they're standing right next to you, they get a free swing at you. So it's a bad idea to shoot when they're right in front of you, um, which is why I splatted him with the axe. All right. A helmet, that's useful. Uh, also to note... I have some stuff I haven't identified. These dark potions, there's a lot of potions in the early game that you you tend to find on these floors that are bad. So this is probably either a poison potion or like a slowness potion. The other thing it could be is anti-venom. That's pretty common on this floor. But until I'm poisoned, I won't be able to figure that out. So I'm just gonna keep them. Murky brown potions are in every game. They're always uh, orcish liqueur. It's like, it's just booze. Um, they give you a little tiny bit of HP back but unless you have some points invested in will, they'll also stun you, which is horrible when you're being attacked. So with high will builds, it's actually really handy to have these murky brown potions around because you can just drink them and it's just like a health potion. But for a character like me, who still has uh, only four will, if I drink one of them, I'm probably going to get stunned, which I don't want in the middle of a fight. Uh, so this is probably a secret door, but... Oh, I found it. My perception is so terrible that I didn't expect to find that. Um, let's go kill this centipede. So right now it might look like things are really easy, I'm just like curb stopping everything I fight. Just give it a couple of stories. So I'm going to keep the short sword and I'm going to drop this curb sword because anything my curb sword does, my battle axe does better. And if I have to hit something that's really hard to hit, I'll switch to the short sword. Oh my god, just open up. Okay. That should be the whole floor. There might be a room over here, but... Nope, that's everything. Okay. It's a tiny floor. It's compact. This is like a Toronto condo here. Not much square footage. Let's go down here. Alright, 200 feet. This is usually where I die. I'm going to save here as a, a checkpoint. and call this part one. Uh, in part two, I'll probably explain a bit more about some of the nuances of... Nuances of uh, how strength works with damage, and we'll fight some more interesting monsters, and we'll start to create an actual build. Uh, oh, I've got 1600 experience, so I'm gonna buy sprinting now. Um, what I did there was that the first ability you buy in any skill group, so my first evasion ability costs 500 experience, the next one costs 1000, the next one will cost 1500, the next one after that will cost 2000. The only exception to that is if you have an affinity for a skill. So, um, what did I pick on, like, Fenarfin or something? I don't even remember. I think we get Perception Affinity. Uh, but my first skill with uh, an affinity ability, I get for free. And if I have Mastery, like, there's some dwarves that have a smithing Mastery, I get two skills for free. So, that's awesome. Um, but I was in the middle of saying that it's time to save, so I'm going to save here. Not that it matters. The game saves every time you go up or down a floor. And I'm going to stop recording. And then part two will pick up right where we left off here. So I'll see you in a couple of minutes.